Good evening. It is a great joy to be worshipping together with you this Lord's Day evening. And um, it is a great privilege to be back here sharing God's Word with you. I've had to dust off my long pants and shoes from the lockdown. Um, And I'll just have to remember to speak up as it's been a while. But could you turn with me in God's Word to Titus chapter 1? And we'll look, we'll read from verse 10 to 2 verse 1. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Let us pray. O gracious God in heaven, we do pray that you would fill us with your Spirit this Lord's day. Please do help me to teach what accords with sound doctrine. And Lord, speak to us tonight. And let us not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. Please bless us this day. Amen. If you've ever been over to visit at my house, you may have noticed a small wooden ship up high on a shelf. And this is something I actually treasure very much. Um, I bought it in Mauritius when I was on honeymoon. And it was probably one of my greatest ever haggles. I mean, I got like three quarters off of the price. That's a story for another day. The reason I bring this model ship up is that it's a scale replica of the HMS Bounty. And it came with a really cool story of the ship's history. The HMS Bounty left England in 1787 with the express mission of transporting breadfruit plants from Tahiti to the West Indies. And initially, the first few legs of their mission was well on track. They stopped here in False Bay, they replenished their supplies, moved on to Tahiti, and after five months there, they had loaded 1,000 breadfruit plants onto the ship, and in 1879, they set out for the final leg of their journey. All seemed well. But just three weeks later, a young dissenter named Fletcher Christian, who had formed a relationship with one of the native women while on the island, convinced a large number of the crew that their life would be better off if they stayed in Tahiti rather than returning home to England and completing their mission. So the crew joined him in a mutiny. They set Captain Bly adrift and set out to start their new lives. Tragically though, when the search party eventually found the mutineers, there was only one survivor. The rest had all been killed, either by one another in their petty squabbles and skirmishes, or by the locals who didn't actually take too kindly to them trying to settle on their islands. Now there is a lot more to the story, and I'm not telling you the story because I think stories of pirates and mutineers are cool. They are cool. Um, Rather, I want to make a point about what went wrong with their journey and um, how things were well on track but met such a disastrous end. Because many churches follow the same faith as the HMS Bounty. Everything seems on track. The church has a healthy membership. They preach the word. 
maybe have a good children's ministry. You know, all nine marks of a healthy church. But through the actions of a few troublemakers, the church is led astray or even possibly split. See, false teaching does this. It's like Fletcher Christian's promise of a utopian life on a paradise island. It sounds great, but ultimately it ends in despair and ruin. Two weeks ago, Andrew preached on the elders and the godly characteristics they needed. (laughs) This week, we're going to look at the opposite. We're going to look at the ungodly characteristics of a false teacher, which is where falsehood grows and trouble brews. In the text here, Paul highlights three areas where falsehood prospers, with false teachers, false worldviews, and false conversions. So let's start with the first one, false teachers, in verse 10 and 11. The problem Paul is addressing in the church is that there are many unsavory characters in this church in Crete, and they're leading the flock astray by teaching false things. The phrase, we see in, the phrase we see in verse 10, especially of the circumcision party, and in verse 14 we see the term Jewish myths, gives us a clue as to what heresy was being taught at the time. It was likely a form of the Galatian heresy, where Jewish Christians were requiring Gentile Christians to be circumcised and follow a number of other Jewish rituals in order to truly be saved. And the situation in the Christ is obviously quite bad. Uh, It wasn't like Paul was saying, look, you may possibly encounter this. No, there are many of these people, he says. We should expect to see this. This isn't a case of now, oh, the preacher's going on about false teachers again. The Bible warns us to be on guard for them because there are many such people waiting to ravage the flock. But what's interesting to note is Paul doesn't actually address the heresy directly here. He, he doesn't go about refuting it um, theologically point for point. He's more concerned with the character or the kind of person who is bringing this in. And this kind of person is the exact opposite to the godly character that Andrew spoke of a few weeks ago. You see, the false teacher is insubordinate, but the elders are told not to be not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. That's verse 6. The false teacher is a deceiver, an empty talker, teaching things he ought not teach. But an elder is someone who um, gives instruction and sound doctrine. The false teacher divides whole families, causes discord amongst them. The elder is one who keeps his household in order. The teacher seeks after unjust gain. The elder is not greedy for gain. And so we're looking at The exact opposite here, the opposite of a godly person, an ungodly one. And the reason we're looking at this character is because the Bible's not concerned at this point in giving us a theological argument to refute a particular heresy, but rather to equip us with understanding of what godly and ungodly characters look like so that we can have the tools to, one, aspire to, to seek after these godly traits, And two, to have the ability to identify these ungodly false teachers when they come in and seek to wreak havoc. So let's look at these character traits. Firstly, insubordinate. People like this don't submit to the authority of the local church. They are these kind of lone ranger Christians, doing whatever they want to. Their ministry or their Christian service or whatever it is, is subject only to themselves. Sadly, we see this a lot in our day and age. Many people saying, I don't need the church. I can just do my own thing. Quite ironically, many of these ministries are headed up by self-appointed heresy hunters who belong to no church but have a website and find a problem with every single pastor from Cape Town to Timbuktu, all across. The only true teacher is the person who has that website. And... They're subject to nobody but themselves. And they fail to see that they are the very person they're trying to smoke out. But they're also acting contrary to the teaching of Scripture. 
Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. If somebody is active in a form, any form of Christian ministry, and they are not subject to the local authority of a local church, what they're doing is illegitimate. This kind of insubordination is the first step to becoming a false teacher yourself. And so we should guard our heart. We should seek to submit to the authority of the local church. <clears throat> Even missionaries who go out into the field, into foreign lands where there are no churches, are sent by local churches and by extension subject to that local church authority. And if you think that, that people can operate like this, just look at the cults. All of them are always formed around one charismatic leader who's ultimately insubordinate and an authority only unto himself. Whether it's Joseph Smith from the Mormons, Charles Russell from Jehovah's Witnesses, T.D. Jakes, or the local prosperity preacher down the road, they're always an authority unto themselves. And from there they ravage the flock with their words that are empty, with their teachings that are contrary to the Bible. And what they say is full of lies. The Lord hates lying lips. These men are detestable to Him. They lead you astray for their own unjust gain. This is what the text says here. And it was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. We just need to turn on TBN. and Have a look at the likes of Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland. Buying private jets. Living it up in exorbitant mansions. All off the back of preaching a false gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity. And this isn't only an American phenomenon. We have our own set of heretics here in South Africa. The likes of Ray McCauley and Ak Bosov. His church is just down the road here in Kuburg. And he peddles this kind of nonsense to the South African people. And then zips around all over in his helicopter making unjust gain of teaching lies. But listen to the words of Proverbs 21, 6 here. The acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor, the pursuit of death. Or even stronger, Ezekiel 22. Behold then, I smite my hand at your dishonest gain. Again, lying lips is what God hates. People who teach for dishonest gain are enemies of God, not his ministers. Stay away from such people. They're insubordinate. They're empty talkers. They deceive for dishonest gain. And what's the result of all of their deception? Well, the text tells us here, upsetting whole families. Now, whether this is a family as in a small household or the church, it doesn't really matter. The point is still the same. False teachers sow discord and overthrow units of people that should have unity. They destroy families. They tear, church, they tear churches apart. They damage entire communities. These are tragic results. It's no small thing. It's not like we should be like, you know, leave the nice little heretic. He's kind of kind. And he's really trying his best. No. Their actions, believers, they sow discord in families and churches. These are things that are united by God's design. And they are torn apart through the actions of these false teachers. The scriptures deal harshly with such people. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. What is that seventh thing? Those who sow discord among brothers. Their actions are an abomination to God. If you read that list, sowing discord amongst brothers is considered worse than hands that shed innocent blood. We respond strongly to this because the scriptures respond strongly to this. And that's why our response should be strong. And again, the text gives us the response here. They must be silenced. We don't. We don't give such teaching the time of day. And I praise the Lord that here at Goodwood Baptist Church, we have 
the godly elders described in verses 5 to 9, who guard this pulpit. They make sure that the church does not peddle this kind of nonsense. And they also is not seen to endorse any of these false teachings. And if somehow some kind of false association is crept in, they will deal with it. It's sad that many churches today don't do this. In an effort to seem more tolerant and ecumenical, they partner up with all manner of teachers. And then they say it's for the cause of the gospel. This is nonsense. Quite literally nonsense. How can you partner in the cause of the gospel with somebody who's preaching a completely different gospel? It makes no sense. But then it's also easy to knock other churches and leaders. Let's just bring this a little bit closer to home. Let's look at us individually. Do we silence this kind of t false teaching in our personal capacity? Maybe you don't preach or teach heresy. But if you look at your bookshelf, there's you know, Joyce Meyer or you know, whatever false teacher there. You know, not the heresy teaching books or DVDs. You know, the good practical self-help stuff. Th things that you might find useful. Or maybe we advocate for these big interfaith prayer meetings. You know, the one Angus Buchan had just a little while ago that many churches were, were advocating for and saying, oh, what a wonderful thing. Um, you know, we could also do it with the music we listen to. You listen to Jesus culture. You know? And by doing that, you're opening people up to the, the stuff taught by Bethel Church. Is this not giving a voice to these false teachers with your actions? Is it not reasonable to expect that um, those around you will see these kinds of actions as an endorsement and maybe be a little bit more open to these false teachers? You know, they may think, you know what? I was a bit skeptical about the, this teacher, but there were solid Bible-believing Christians from Goodwood Baptist Church, and they're involved with them. It can't be all that bad. It is that bad. We should silence them. We shouldn't give them a platform to speak. Our actions should not endorse such false teachers. Now let's look at the second area Paul talks about in verse 12 to 14. A false worldview. If you think the text has been harsh so far, just have a look at verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Up at night. If someone said this about a people group today, there would be riots and protests until that person was cancelled. Our video is probably going to be taken off YouTube for hate speech, just for reading the text. And, and the reason is because this seems like such a broad generalization about an entire group of people. And let's be honest, if somebody spoke today like that about another people group, we wouldn't condone such, such talk. But that's actually something we need to consider when interpreting this text. That we live in an age where firstly, coarse language is oftentimes frowned upon. And if the listener feels offense at a statement, we should sympathize with them rather than try to understand what the author's intention was. But this is not how people communicated 2,000 years ago. So before we dismiss Paul as a Cretan-hating bigot, let's try to understand what he's actually trying to communicate here. Firstly, he's quoting a man by the name of Epimenides is what most scholars think, who was an ancient Cretan prophet speaking about his own people. You know, Paul brings this out in the text. Secondly, this kind of coarse language was often used in the ancient world. 
This kind of generalizing language was used. And it didn't necessarily carry the bigoted attention, intentions many of us assign to it today. And finally, these characteristics weren't always seen as particularly moral vices. Especially in Crete, they were oftentimes embraced. Um, it was part of Cretan life. The Greek language actually has a word, kritizo, which means lying. And it was used in Crete. They weren't particularly ashamed of this assessment. See, Paul was not branding an entire people group with the same brush in order to alienate them and, and say they're beyond hope. No, rather, he was referring to the culture on the island, or their worldview, if I may. He was reminding Titus exactly where he was, right in the thick of, right in the thick of it, with Cretan people who had a radically different understanding of the world than he did. You see, worldview matters. Think of it like looking through a lens or binoculars. If they turn the right way and they magnify the objects, everything you look at feels much closer. If you turn it around that they make the object, everything you look at feels much further away. The reality is the objects have not changed. They are the same distance from you regardless of which way those binoculars are turned. But the perception of it changes depending on how, what you're looking through. See, worldview is the foundation of your thinking. It determines how you make sense of what's going on around you. This was highlighted to me very recently when we were planning our trip to Kenya. And Aubrey shared with us of a time when he was preaching to a particular group of African people and in their culture, to betray somebody was seen as an act of strength. So if you read to them the account where Judas betrays Jesus, many of them come away thinking that Judas is the hero in that story, which is completely backwards to what the text intends to convey. See, first we need to correct the worldview, give them a biblical understanding of deception, before you can go on teaching texts like that. Worldview matters. Paul is explaining this to Titus, that the Cretans' view of the world is insufficient. It makes them susceptible to false teaching and causes them to follow after Jewish myths and the commands of men. And this is the result of a faulty worldview. You are led astray to follow after silly myths and man-made silly myths and man-made ideas. And so the Cretan people, what's happening here is they import this faulty worldview into the church, this view that champions lying and laziness. And as a result of that, these false teachers who have characteristics now have a special appeal. And the Cretan church is led astray. And this is no different from today. We see this all over. Think, for example, of the African worldview where many live in fear of curses and how much needs to be done to appease the ancestors in order to break or even avoid such curses. Take that worldview and bring it into a Christian setting and you have deliverance ministries. And what do we see here in Africa? Deliverance ministries, left, right and center. The same general concept, breaking generational curses, seeking out blessing. It's just now surrounded with Christian language. And even in a more Western setting, where our worldview is rooted in humanism. Humanism is the general idea that humanity has the power in and of itself to fix all our problems and bring about utopia. This idea gets brought into the Christian church, and we have liberalism. We abandon the superstition of the Bible and just focus on being moral and tolerant to bring about this new world. And more recently, we see this kind of thing in the whole social justice movement. Embracing the idea that the gospel is not sufficient to bring about social change. No, you need to become woke. You need to embrace fanciful notions of privilege and try to work to bring about social revolution, working together with the government. 
That's how change comes, not the gospel. These are silly little myths. They may not be Jewish this time around, but they are myths nonetheless. We don't bring this kind of man-made nonsense into the church. Rather, we should build our ideas on the basis of the Bible. The Bible should shape your understanding of the world. Not the other way around, where your thoughts of the world shape your interpretation of the Bible. And when somebody does bring these ideas into the church, what should we do? How should we respond? Well, the text tells us again. Rebuke them sharply. A person who brings this kind of thinking into the church should be opposed and rebuked. And it should be done so sharply is what the text here. They should be straight up told. This idea is rubbish. There's no place in the church of Christ. Don't bring it here. It's a bit harsh though. You know, shouldn't we try and maintain unity? Like, is it really so bad if people have ideas that are slightly different? You know, shouldn't we give them time to explore it out, work it out of their system? I'd say no. Look at what it leads to. We just looked at that. These are serious consequences. And so they warrant a serious response. Oppose those ideas. and Rebuke those who want to bring them into the church. It's not harsh and unloving to do this. In fact, I'd argue it's to the contrary. It's loving. This is what the text is. We rebuke so that they might be sound in the faith. This is a good and loving thing to want for somebody. Our intentions are to ensure, ensure that people stay sound in the faith. <coughs> Excuse me. And please hear me out now. I'm not saying we should be running around issuing sharp rebukes at every single person we differ with now. Let us remember Jesus' advice about taking the log out of our own eye before we attempt to remove the splinter from a brother's eye. But what we can't do is just leave our fellow Christian brothers and sisters in error. Again, consider the words of Proverbs 27 verse 5. Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Open rebukes are good when they are timely and necessary and done in such a loving manner. So deal with your heart and your motives first, yes. Check your worldview for error before you start um, calling out other people's. But then from there, and in love, we should seek to correct our brothers by issuing such rebukes. Next, let's look at the third point, false conversions um, or false professions. Um, we, could have it either, we could have it either way. From verse 15, Paul really starts getting to the heart of the matter now. The problem here is that an unpure heart will always, will always corrupt all things. False teachers may profess Christ with their mouths, but they show with their works the true state of their hearts, that they do not actually know Him. And you have to smile at the irony here. I really enjoyed this. The Isers, the ones who are preaching a works-based righteousness, they're told, your works is shows that you deny God. This must have really gotten under their skin. If Paul lived today, verse 16 would probably be one of those YouTube-owned videos. You know, the Apostle Paul destroys the Judaizers. Click on it. And Paul's standing on a college campus somewhere. And there's some young, woke, Judaizer hipster saying to Paul, we preach a gospel of works and encourage people to good works. Paul responds, you preach a works based righteousness. You may profess God with your mouth, but you deny him with your works. Choose thug life music, those little sunglasses that come across, 
mic drop, pull out, conversation over. The reason we enjoy this kind of irony and why we find it so beautifully funny is that it's true. I mean, we can never truly know the state of another's heart. But the one thing we can safely say about a cult leader, about all cult leaders, is that they are unbelievers. They don't believe the gospel, hence the cult. And Calvin puts it like this um, when commenting on this. He says, since in God's sight there is nothing pure apart from faith, it follows that unbelievers are all unclean. Thus they will not obtain the cleanness they desire by any laws or regulations. For being themselves impure, nothing in the world can be pure to them. Their wicked, from their wicked evil works, and, or their wicked evil works come from a wicked and unconverted heart. And this isn't a new idea. Jesus taught this in Matthew 17. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And so they take all that looks good and right, and they corrupt it. This is the result of an unconverted heart, or a false conversion. It defiles all that is good, and makes it useless. In verse 15, Paul is echoing an idea from Jesus' teaching, something he taught in Mark 7, verse 41, and I can't remember the Luke reference. It's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but rather what comes out of a person that defiles. This is why everything they do is defiled, impure, and useless. Even if these are things that we would generally see, as good, generally see as good things, as blessings and gifts to the church. A person can have the most outstanding theological knowledge, read all the best books. They could be the most gifted speaker or preacher. They could have the best evangelistic techniques or any other thing you can think of. If that person is unconverted, it is all this. It is defiled. It is unfit for any good work. See, this is a heart issue. And a defiled heart contaminates all the works done by that person. It's like putting poison in a reservoir. The poison contaminates all the water. It's not like some of the water is still good. If I came up to you, and I said, you know what, I poured this water in such a special way that I got none of the poison and only the good water. You wouldn't drink it. Because you know the second the poison hits that water, all of it is contaminated. It is the same with an unconverted heart. It corrupts all the works it does. To fix this, a new and pure heart is needed. And so how do we respond to this? I mean, none of us can bring about a second birth. We don't have the power to give a new heart. But look at 2 verse 1. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. In fact, this whole passage on false, te whole passage on false teaching is sandwiched between two verses that emphasize this notion of teaching what accords with sound doctrine. Verse 9 as well. You know, and, and I think that really emphasizes the point here. We are to teach what accords with sound doctrine. To preach the word. We aren't told to outright address every heresy that comes our way as if our goal is single argument and show how intellectually superior we are. There are times for that, yes. But no, what we should always persevere to do is to teach what accords with sound doctrine. And the reason we teach sound biblical doctrine is that there is great power in God's Word. Firstly, it equips believers to deal with all necessary challenges. This is why, at the end of Acts, Paul commends the church to God and the Word, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance 
amongst all those who are sanctified. This is how Christians are kept safe from falsehood, through the teaching of God's Word, which is able to make the servants of God thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3. It's a very well-known verse in this church. There is great power and um, strength and benefit in Christians being immersed in, in the sound teaching of God's Word. That is why we do it here at this church. But secondly, the teaching of sound word or, or biblical truth is also the mechanism used by God to bring about change in people's hearts. Just listen to what the scriptures say in this matter. The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Psalm 119 verse 130. Romans 10, 17. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Or James 1, 21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And I can go on and on. Trust me, I had a list about this long. I mean, you could go to Psalm 119, open it and just point at a verse and it will likely tell you of the benefits of God's word. See, Paul had been emphasizing the heart problem of these people here not because he wants to show that false teachers are now beyond hope and past salvation too far away. Rather, he wants to show their desperate need for the gospel. I mean, just think about your own conversion when you think about that. Don't forget that at one point you also had a heart of stone, a heart that raged against the things of God and defiled all that you did. I was exactly the person described in verse 15 and 16. And it was because somebody came to me and taught me the truth of God's word, the life-giving truth of the gospel, that I deserved hell and punishment. And for reasons I will never be able to fully explain, Christ himself went to the cross and bore that wrath on my behalf, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it was through this proclamation of biblical truth, this teaching of sound doctrine, that I was given a new heart. I was given life. I was converted from an unbeliever to a believer. God brought about that heart change needed to make me pure and to make my works pure. You see, we may be incapable of bringing about the second birth, but we are certainly not unequipped to address this issue. This word of God contains the power to save souls and it affirms that it does that. So teach what accords with sound doctrine. Let us pray. O great God in heaven, we do thank you for your word that has been a blessing to your people throughout the ages. We thank you that we live in an age where we have abundant access to it. Please do help us to not neglect the teachings of your word. To not set it aside for the pursuit of trivial things. Help us to seek after you more and in all that we do to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Amen.